This next session is going to have Steve Young from Orbitz. He's going to talk about um, Steve Young's their uh, site reliability engineering lead. He also did this presentation, or, or he did a presentation last year. This is a rev up. Uh, they use quite a few cl couch based clusters, and uh, he keeps busy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm Stephen Young. I'm the technical manager for operations uh, and technology at Orbitz Worldwide, a uh, global company. We have um, businesses all over the globe. As you can see, several of them um, will be named on the, next, the following slides along the bottom. Uh, but I manage our site reliability engineering team and our platform delivery group, uh, which is in charge of our cloud uh, platform for both of our data centers and all of our B2B enterprise environments that we set up for our customers. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is basically what we at, um, it's not working, there we go, All right. uh, it's looking at what Orbitz initially wanted to go into the market to use for a NoSQL um, uh, solution. We were initially looking to consolidate all of the different products that we were using. Uh, many of them were we were using Memcached. We had some people using Membase, um, some Coherence, some um, uh, Terracotta was being used, EHCache, uh, and it was a, kind of a nightmare to manage. Uh, we had too few people in too many platforms deployed by whatever developer wanted to use whatever they thought suited their application. Uh, so what we wanted to do was consolidate everything, find one group to manage that, which happened to be one of my teams. Uh, at the time, it was senior administration. Uh, now it's part of SRE. So that we would actually take control and own caching as a shared service. So what we've done over the last two years since we started with Memcache, or with Membase, I think it was 165 uh, was the version at the time when we, when we started our proof of concept, is um, this is, this is more the end result. We started with one cache uh, for some sessions and just seeing how it would manage uh, for failover so that whenever we did upgrades or wanted to change between data centers, how reliable was it? How were we gonna be able to maintain our sessions without dropping customers and then uh, them going and shopping elsewhere, basically? Um, through our testing uh, and our evaluations, we have now grown to at this time last year, it was 17 clusters we were running. We've done some consolidation, and now we're actually running the 11 clusters, uh, with four of them being mirrored between two different data centers uh, and using cross-data center replication. Uh, greater than three terabytes of data, that's basically three terabytes, plus you add four of them being mirrored, so it's roughly around uh, four and a half, five terabytes of data, because uh, it's our larger caches that are actually being mirrored. And then we have around two or 430 million objects at any given time. A lot of these things expire 60, 90 minutes. Um, half of our caches are longer lived, anywhere from seven days to a few months, depending on what, what the content is of the cache. Um, and 146 million being the largest. Uh, that would be like one of our hotel property caches that stores information on properties, rates, um, content, descriptions, links to photographs, et cetera. And uh, total operations per second, we've got it down to around uh, 75,000 operations per second. On average, um, this gener that generally goes anywhere from 75,000 up to 150,000, depending on peak usage. If there's ads running at the time, uh, depending on the, the, the country, uh, we had about a month ago or so a, a big ad that ran in France for our eBookers uh, product, and we had to boost up capacity. We didn't have to touch our caches. The only thing we had to, to boost up in capacity was our front-end web apps. Um, one of the reasons why we've chosen Couchbase is because we didn't have to worry about the capacity on there. We have everything sized properly. Didn't matter that the traffic grew by 300% for that six hours that this ad was running. The caches were not even affected. Uh, operations per second pretty much doubled, but we didn't have to worry about it. Uh, and then. Again, this doubles pretty much with our high, availabil uh, high availability between the two data centers. Uh, this is not working. Um, 
the next slide here is in the beginning what we were looking for, uh, which being the scalability of the cache. Uh, we wanted a drop-in replacement for memcached, and we wanted something to release uh, to relieve our databases. We we're using several different databases, um, everything from Oracle, MySQL, um, SQL servers, um, and at any given time, any of that data may take quite a bit of uh, uh, latency being delivered to our customers. And if anybody out here is like me, I get a little antsy, a little impatient when I'm waiting for something to come up on the screen. And in the travel business, when you're trying to sell travel, um, you don't want your customers to get bored. You don't want them sitting there waiting and then going to your competitors. So it's very important for us when we deliver a feature-rich environment um, and a, an experience for our customers that they get whatever data we need to get back to them as quickly as possible. Um, so. What we've done is taken Couchbase and put it in front of some of our main databases that have to remain in an RDBS world, uh, mainly for you know, keeping the information. We have to store a lot of data for a very long time. Um, we have a lot of back-end reporting that has to be done, reports that have to be sent to uh, airline reporting corporations and accounting and, and then to the airlines and et cetera. Uh, but a lot of the data that's in there, when we want to present it to our customers, we preload it into Couchbase caches so that um, the applications can then fetch the information uh, from one of two different ways. Um, with our HA caching, we've actually taken the Couchbase library and built our own that reads and does gets and puts to two cache clusters at the same time. So what it'll do is uh, get the information, uh, if it's, if it, it'll, it'll do a get. If it can't find the information, it pulls it from somewhere else and then it'll put it into the caches. Uh, and then whichever one it's responding to the fastest will get it across to a set of replication, we'll send it to the other side of the house. Um, and then, you know, once a week, once a month, anytime we need to do any kind of maintenance, we can take one side of the house down in the cache and our application is built so that the configuration says, if this cache is not responding, Gonna ignore it for a while, keep talking to the other data center, and then periodically poll to see if the other cache is available, and then they'll start using it again. Um, this allows us to reach our dream of zero downtime maintenance, uh, which for anybody else out there, when you go to a website that says, sorry, we're currently dusted, or you know, we're doing maintenance, uh, any given Saturday or Sunday, Chase online, you can't go in and do any of your banking because they've got their maintenance going on. Um, I'm a firm believer in you do maintenance, you lose money, um, and you can very well lose customers. So it's important for us to keep everything going. Um, from the bottom up is basically our philosophy on building our caches now. We've spent a lot of time over the last two years trying to figure out the best approach for how we're going to build out a bucket. Uh, we have a, a, an end user that comes to us with a request and says, I need a cache. Um, okay, what do you want it for? Well, uh, you know, I just need to store some data in it and I need to pull it up and I need to present it to my customers uh, you know, three or four times a day, probably gonna be a thousand objects. Well, what are the sizes? You know, what's your metadata? What, you know, we have to evaluate every little piece of it because a lot of times the developers don't know exactly what they want the cache for. Uh, when we started this process, it was initially to convert all of our existing caches into one manageable, um, administratable uh, product. And suddenly everybody wanted to cache. It wasn't just about moving everything over from one product to another. It was, you know, look at this great uh, piece of software. Couchbase can solve all of our problems and I want this cache and I want that cache. And as administrators, we didn't know what we were doing any more than what they knew what they were doing as far as developing for it. Um, Couchbase has been wonderful in helping us get um, talking with my hands, I keep changing my slides. <coughs> um, Couchbase, Couchbase has been wonderful with helping us along uh, with training and finding out where we're, our pitfalls were. Um, so I'm gonna go through in the next few slides some lessons that kind of discuss some of these things that we've learned um, from memory concerns, disk utilization, whether or not virtualization is right for us, and bloatware on the servers, which is you know, everything else that's running in the background and things that do you need it on there, do you, do you not? Um, so starting with 
our first lesson here is establishing a standard architecture. We had in the beginning you know, three different server types, all in one cluster, I figured least common denominator. It ended up being 36 gigs of, of hard drive space and 16 gigs of RAM, but then we found that one box had six processors, dual core, another one had four processors, dual core, another one had two quad cores. It, it just became a logistical nightmare when we were trying to troubleshoot anything that was going on. Of course, this is also Membase 165. When those servers were put in, it was part of our proof of concept, and it was running so smoothly, we never bothered to go back and check how things were running. Uh, in the, in the, anybody who was in the troubleshooting um, cluster group this morning, uh, Perry and uh, Alex were talking about how you know it'll run smoothly for quite a while, and then suddenly you run into a, a problem, and then you go to try and rebalance, and it won't, or the, the box is swapping, or there's not enough disk space. So these are all things that we that we found out. Um, so we had to size the the environments properly for what we were using them for. Exact same disk space on every on every server. The exact same amount of RAM. The same uh, processor types. Uh, where available, you know, we don't all have the uh, ability to make sure every single server is bought the exact same day so that it's the exact same model, uh, but as close as possible. You know, we have probably about three different generations of blades that we're using on some of our caches that, you know, the, the biggest problem is making sure that the BIOS is the same version between all of the servers and that the ILO cards are accessible and um, that they're on evenly distributed through our data center so that we're not worried about you know, three boxes in the cluster coming down if a rack or, or a uh, switch happens to have a problem. Uh, but then all of that falls under testing the environment. So we built the exact same thing in our staging environment as we have in our production environment so that we can throw the exact same traffic, um, usually on a smaller scale, would be about 20% of production, um, be nice to have the exact same number of servers uh, for everything, but uh, we just don't have the room and it's not uh, economically feasible to do that. But uh, a general representation of production and pre-production that we can send traffic to and test for failures. We go ahead and do a mock failure of a box by going into the, the console and shutting off the NIC, um, see how that responds, how does the cluster act? And more importantly is how is my application going to act? Uh, we can pretty much tell that from cluster to cluster, we know that it's going to fail over a node. Um, if you've got replicas set up properly, uh, you'll be able to get into the application or you'll be able to get into the cluster and uh, remove the node, balance in a new one, whatever you need to do. But how is your application going to handle that failure? Um, those are things that we test a lot in pre-production, which we didn't do in, in the beginning. Um, and then is what that goes along with performance testing is how much traffic can we throw at this? You know, we've had times where we've built clusters that had 30 buckets. We kind of overrode the, the system maximum of 10 just to see what would happen. You know, we had less servers in staging. We needed more buckets. 30 doesn't quite work. Uh, 10, good limit. <laughs> uh, we, we push it with 14 on a few. But um, you've got to have the, the hardware for it. We're using 24 cores, um, a lot more RAM than is required. Um, so we can kind of get away on some, of the, on some of our clusters for doing that. Um, but getting back to this, we, we then document all of those failures. Um, I don't like to be called in the middle of the night. The guys that work for me don't like being called in the middle of the night. So when we do all these tests and we validate how our application reacts, how the cluster reacts, what kind of steps need to be taken, taken to uh, alleviate the issue, whether it's rebalancing, putting in a new node, flipping from one data center to the other on our applications, because we've built in the ability through an mbean to change a config and reload it so our application immediately starts pointing to a different cluster. Uh, those things all get documented, put into standard operating procedures, and I don't get bothered on Saturday night. So um, the next lesson was getting to know what our customers wanted. What, what do they want out of the cash? So it goes back when I said that we initially started this and people uh, were coming to our group and saying, I want a cash, 
Uh, don't necessarily know what I'm doing with it, but I want all my data put somewhere that I can get it out to my customers quickly. So it became a matter of, you know, we get the sizing spreadsheet from Couchbase. We supplement it with our own uh, questionnaires uh, and, and template now so that we ask them with their object size and numbering, uh, the number of objects that they're gonna have, the time to live on their objects. Uh, a lot of times the, our groups have just, what, TTL? I, I won't just stay in there until I change it. Well, the problem is if they're keying off of their session, how often is the session number or the quote code going to be the same for an object? Um, chances are never, or you know, very unlikely. So they'd have these objects stuck in the cache forever and it would fill up and fill up and fill up until eventually it would crash. Um, so these are things that we have to get right off the top of the bat. Um, then it is, is this cache going to be relied on by more than one application? So that we know where we're going to put this bucket in relation to other clusters. Is it gonna to have to be a new cluster? Is it going to work and play well with another cluster that's got four or five or six other buckets on it? Um, and are there more than one bucket on the same cluster that are required by a particular application? So these are all concerns that we have to think about uh, when placing these resources through our environment. And then, you know, is it something that can be a Memcached type bucket, or depending on their requirements, do they want replicas? Do they want to be able to fail over? Do they want to be able to do map reduce jobs and indexing queries, et cetera? Then they has to, of course, be a couch-based type bucket. And then, as well as the data, is, it, is there the storing binary information or JSON type uh, information? Because we still have a lot of old caches that were merged over that are still using Memcached buckets, uh, at least until the first of the year. That's their deadline uh, for moving over to 2.0, so they have to kind of switch how they're using it. Um, but it's a, a big consideration, because a lot of our folks don't even realize that they can save things as JSON documents. And then we have cash behaving badly. Uh, this was one of our most recent lessons learned, is trying to figure out through troubleshooting, contacting Couchbase uh, more often than we needed to, um, or should have needed to, I should say, uh, because of rebalancing issues, um, swapping the memory consumption on the boxes, and then you know one of the things that we found out was a lot of our developers were using outdated libraries. Uh, they were using their own, they were pulling it down, adding it to their code in a different file structure uh, that was above our core library that is controlled by my group, because normally we want to do an update to the library, the next time they release their code, they get it. But not if it's in a different directory that's higher up in the architecture uh, structure based on the way our applications are, are uh, laid out. So we had to get control of that and mandate that a certain core group of libraries gets used. Um, if it doesn't, it's gonna cause a problem. We'll support X number of versions backward, uh, but we don't wanna keep running into situations where if you're using library version 1.03 on a Couchbase 2.0 cluster and you hit rebalance, your disk is gonna get full with log entries saying that might be bucket because the library does not match the cluster uh, as far as capabilities and um, you know, there's many other things that are gonna law, that are gonna cause problems. But we found through um, not only validating and doing our pre-production testing, things we didn't do in the beginning, uh, and then reaching out to Couchbase, that we were one of the, the folks that really didn't grasp that, okay, we have 96 gigs of RAM in a box, and we're gonna give 92 gig of that to Couchbase. Then we're gonna throw App Dynamics on the box. Then we're gonna throw Drone D on the box to keep things running. Then we're gonna throw HP Agents and CF Engine and a bunch of other bloatware on the server that requires the resources that the server no longer has. So what happens? Well, the cluster runs fine for a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But the minute one thing would go wrong and we had to rebalance, either the rebalance would outright fail, it would look like it would run, and then within 10, 20 minutes, it would fail. Couldn't figure out why. Um, you know, proper troubleshooting on our part would have been, I don't have enough memory. Uh, but we didn't really 
at the time grasped the idea that just because we're saying 92 gigs of RAM is going to Couchbase, that doesn't mean Couchbase doesn't need more memory for all the other things that it's doing. So um, one of the other things is, you know, there's, there's cash in the couch. A um, little play on words. Okay, look at my shoes. <laughs> See, there's the laugh. Uh, <laughs> so what we need to know is uh, what is our total cost of operation, not ownership. Um, it's, it's a great deal of time and energy and effort on the, on the side of administration to make sure that the caches are properly being used, whether they're being used as data stores or just caching data, and, uh, data information, fronting databases, however you're using it, um, there is a, a cost of operation, uh, which is for the resources, you know, what kind of hardware are you going to be able to put it on, um, whether or not you're going to be able to mirror and have uh, the same thing in other data centers, uh, whether or not you need five nodes or 10 nodes or split between two different clusters. These are all things to take into consideration. And then you have the, the administrative costs of the people that need to know how these clusters are, are to be set up and operated and keeping people informed of all the changes that you're making. Um, it's important to note that when doing upgrades to Couchbase, you have to know exactly how it's going to affect your applications, how your buckets are going to react to the, whether you're going to do a swap rebalance or do as, uh, in many cases, Orbitz is doing or we're in the process of doing with our clusters is doing the mirroring in two different data centers. So we can take one side down, send an MBean uh, command for a re uh, config reload, our apps keep working, the other cluster keeps working, we shut off cross data center replication for the time being, uh, and then go ahead and upgrade one side. Once it's done, you know, it depends on how quickly we want to do it. There's cases where we completely wipe out the data on that, data, on that cluster, upgrade it, bring it back up, and then turn cross data center replication back on. A uh, perfect example was in one of the larger ones that I mentioned earlier that's about 156 or 146 gigs of data it took roughly an hour and a half to cross data center replicate all of that data back to the um, rebuilt side. Uh, granted, there was no traffic going to the other side, but that's the way we built it, so that we could shut off the one side, make sure no traffic's going to it, upgrade it, replicate everything back, and then once it's done, put traffic back onto it. And then there's the usage and consolidation. I had mentioned this time last year we had 17 different clusters, a lot of different things going on in them. Um, so my group took the time to evaluate every single bucket. Um, I had mentioned that a lot of our developers came to us and said, I want a bucket, I want a bucket. I want to put this somewhere and I want to, I want to get some data. Um, we didn't bother asking what was in it, just you know, what's the size, how many objects, how long is it going to be there. We didn't ask the, the very, very important question of what is this data? Because it's uh, important to know that for consolidation purposes, we found out we had several buckets with the exact same stuff in it being accessed from the exact same application. Why? Because there might have been one little thing different in one of the buckets that might have had a problem and required a flushing at 10 a.m. every day, a uh, programmatic flushing of production data. Not a good thing. Uh, yeah, make sure your application notes what is wrong with the data before it actually gets put in a bucket. Um, so those are things that we're working on, making sure that we're validating the information and making sure that we're putting it in the right place. So that if down the road we need to uh, build indexing or map reduce jobs, we can do it on one bucket instead of having five buckets doing the exact same thing, wasting our resources. Uh, wasting administrative time. So it's all pretty much a balancing act. And that is between the consolidation, what we're going to replicate, how often we're going to replicate, um, you know, whether or not, because you can do bidirectional replication. Um, one of the things that we're also doing is for MapReduce jobs and indexing, not allowing it in production, simply because most of our uh, buckets are so highly used and we don't want any, any cause for even a millisecond of latency. Uh, we're very conscious of how 
how latent our applications are. So what we've done is developed a method of uh, instructing the users when they want to MapReduce or they want to start doing these things. They work with our group in pre-production, set up whatever um, uh, queries that they want to do, and we put them on a different cluster that has cross data set of replication out of the production boxes. So we send it to a non-production environment on a completely different cluster, and then they can query to their heart's content against that data uh, without causing any kind of problem in production. Down the road, whenever we want to create MapReduce jobs that are for production, we'll re-examine how we're doing that. But you know, for the time being, we're still, we're still biting uh, or uh, is that growing our teeth or <laughs> on, on that whole query in MapReduce because um, we, we've been spending most of our time trying to figure out what is the exact fit for um, the hardware, for our environment, are we doing the right thing? Um, you know, granted, we had, on our past caches, approximately you know, 300 plus servers that were just in one data center and probably a, another 100 or so in another data center that did all of our caching at the time. We've probably doubled, maybe even tripled, the amount of cache that we're using uh, for, our, for our applications uh, since initiating the couch base relationship, um, but we're only using 100 nodes. Uh, and quite frankly, we're, some of those nodes we may not, we can, we're probably underutilizing. So we can take some of those nodes out and use them for a different cluster altogether. Um, the other thing is, uh, I had mentioned the offloading processes, so that what we're doing with that is the moving of cross data center, cross data center replication for data to completely different uh, cluster for MapReduce and querying. And then there's the libraries. Um, as I said, we had probably seven or eight different libraries coming from seven or eight different places uh, trying to track down why people were having problems. We looked at our core files and said, okay, that's the latest library version. Why are you having this problem? Why are you still getting these errors in your log when we're rebalancing? Because um, if you're getting if you have the wrong library and you rebalance and you're getting these errors and your application keeps trying to reopen connections, first of all, you're gonna go over your 9,000 connection limit. Um, your operations per second are gonna go through the roof uh, because the box is still trying to get uh, information on where, it's, where the uh, bucket is, where its object can be found. Um, and then, as I just found out today, there's uh, with the first Tuesday of every month, there's a new library you know, having said that we were, and I, I keep saying version 1.03 of the library on purpose because that's what we were using. Uh, and it was 1.19 the last time I checked, so now it's what, 1.20, 1.21? All right, so, um, you know, quite a, you know quite, a, quite a bit behind on our library. Um, so, you know, there, there's the proper use of uh, the applications, reaching out, finding out what's going on, and doing all the troubleshooting understanding the administrative side of Couchbase, uh, which has been you know, most of what we've done the last year. So um, looking back uh, uh, at the end of the, these use cases, I will kind of compare what we had planned on doing last year, what we managed, what we actually were able to do, and kind of our next steps of what we're looking uh, at for the future. So we have a use case. Um, one of the things that we use our caches for and are looking to actually migrate this over to data store. One of, the, one of our first use case possibilities for doing so is on content for a particular uh, stream of data for our, our front end. And you know, this content w contains HTML for the most part, um, as well as links to images for our front end caching that we use for Akamai. And uh, it uses the, the HA caching and cross data center replication. Um, and we're looking to, instead of pulling this stuff off of NFS and uh, populating it into caches, then we're thinking of actually using it as a data store and eliminating the NFS need. Um, so there's a, here's an example of the, the high availability that we've set into motion. It's um, the top is what we used to do. We would have 14 to 20 boxes 
one, uh, split between two data centers and using our high-speed link between them, it was all one cluster. We figured, oh, you know, this is great. Now, again, this was before cross data center replication was, uh, was available. And we figured, you know, we, 40 gig link between the data centers, if we lose a node or a data center goes down, we can hop along with, you know, half the nodes going out. You know, it doesn't work. If you lose half your nodes in a cluster, you've, you've gone over the maximum allowed number for auto failover. And, um, you know, we were already at 75, 80% for our high watermark or towards our high watermark, and uh, suddenly you're at 160%, which of course is not possible, but uh, we started losing everything when one of our data centers actually went down. So we've changed it over to this new model, which is using the cross data center replication. We've split same, same number of nodes, but now they're two different caches. Um, whatever comes into data center one, now this is future, but whatever would come into data center one would stay in that data center and data center two and it would stay in that data center as well. So we can possibly be able to split our traffic in that way. Um, and then the next use case is upselling. So we're looking at possibly being able to grab information from our other caches, do some MapReduce jobs, see what kind of results uh, are, are trending um, and then create packages, upsell. Um, take cater the ads that are showing up on the page to what people have been searching for. Say if they've been searching for airfare into Miami for a certain set of dates, we can probably have correlated what's going on in Miami at that time. If there's a convention in town, um, we can pull up transportation to and from the hotel or to special events that are happening and maybe present that, that kind of information. These are things that are still in my head, so I don't know what, if, if our, uh, our dynamic packaging in, in ads group will actually like to do that. You know, it's been submitted, but these are just use cases that have been thrown around between myself and my team. Uh, and use case three is search history and trends. Again, um, there's, a, there's a lot of treasure in the data that you get of what your customers do on your site. So collecting that information, throwing it into a data store, and being able to search back on it, uh, and then possibly using Couchbase Lite uh, on mobile is being able to store that stuff. If you have uh, a membership program, like Orbitz is uh, soon going to be launching, we can present data and store what our customers have been looking up. Uh, and then the next time they log in, we notice that there's a trend of them going to Dallas the third week of every month. Maybe we present them from this data store. Um, you know, these are the things that you were doing. This is the hotel you look at. We've already priced it. So we say these are the prices for this type of room at, at this particular hotel. Um, it's all stuff that can come out of the Couchbase caches. And um, having talked about Couchbase lights, you know, lights are going on in my head. I originally had thought, you know, I, I didn't know if it was something that we could use, but uh, you learn something new every day. Uh, and then stored pricing, um, properties, again, um, what are the prices for these properties? What properties are hot in a particular place? Uh, somebody's going to Vegas and uh, Planet Hollywood is really hopping this particular weekend because uh, I don't know who's in town. Um, you know, Miley Cyrus might be there doing some twerking and everybody wants to go <laughs> and catch the, the train wreck. But uh, those are, again, types of things that we might be able to gather. Um, so then we're trying to imagine the possibilities. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing is alerting, um, uh, co collecting of alerting, not just alerting for what's happening with Couchbase, but um, the last couple of days we've actually had a thing going on at work where it's a day away, you get to pick a project and spend your time building this thing out. And one of mine was a, a flood control system that would take all the alerts from all of our systems put them in one into one collection of data in a Couchbase data store. And then we'd be able to build a front end to go in and say, uh, put these servers or group of servers into maintenance mode for this period of time, this is the change ticket, um, and this is the day they're supposed to come out. And it'll actually block all those alerts from going to the console for the people in our operations center so they're not getting flooded with a bunch of data uh, that they have to try and act on. So server's been decommed, they don't have to see it. Server's in maintenance, they don't have to see it. Um, configuration management, you know, storing configuration. We've actually already started doing this. So we're storing configs for our applications in Couchbase buckets so that the application eventually can start pulling that configuration every so often. And as soon as it sees that it's changed, 
it's going to reload itself with the new configuration. Um, caching of RD, uh, the, or fronting RDBS um, uh, databases, we're already doing that. A lot of our Oracle databases, we do have caches built in front of. Um, now, th there are products, other products for doing that, but why, why should we do that? We've already have this, this um, relationship with Couchbase. We've already got the data there. Why not use it? Um, and there's things for release management as well. You know, we thought that somebody's going to be releasing something new. We want to check their, the dependencies. One of those dependencies is the library for using Couchbase. You want a merge request, you put in your, uh, put that in, but then we can check the dependencies through a, a quick app that's going to validate against a Couchbase data store and return a yes or a no. Yeah, you can do your merge. No, you need to update your Couchbase libraries before you do it. Um, and then trending analysis, kind of already talked about that. So to just sum it all up, the foundations that we found for success were building everything from the ground up, um, evaluating your environment, figuring out exactly what your needs are equipment-wise, staff-wise, um, number of nodes, sizing, et cetera. Uh, knowing your environment, which is not necessarily knowing the hardware by itself, but knowing what you need the caches for, what the purpose is, um, you know, what's going into that bucket. Is that data already exists somewhere else that you can either use, do a MapReduce on, um, et cetera. And know your limitations, uh, knowing what you can do. Don't do more than 10 buckets on a cluster, uh, unless you're gonna beef up your hardware. And even if then, it's, you, know, you have to, do a balancing act. Can I do five memcached if, I, if I've got them in two heavy hitting couch base type buckets? Um, and then monitor. Really need to monitor what's going on um, in your environment. Just because it's working properly today doesn't mean that the next couple of releases of your application code, you didn't introduce something new that's not gonna work to play well with it. Um, it may look fine on the surface, but if your disk queues are, are increasing and your uh, latency is increasing slowly over time. You have to monitor that stuff to figure out what's going on in your environment.